I just want to thank all of the great professionals, men and women, uh, doctors and nurses and paramedics and first responders and law enforcement, by the way. If you look at New York and you see how the effect that this had on law enforcement, it's been incredible. These are great people, firefighters. Great people. They're helping in so many different ways. So thank you very much. And if you'd like, we'll take a few questions. John, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Yesterday, you, you said that you would be extending the guidelines through the end of April and that you'd be giving us specifics right. tomorrow. Do you expect that the guidelines will just carry on the guidelines uh, that have been in place now for 15 days? Could there potentially be some modification? Also, you have some travel restrictions that come up for reconsideration. Yeah. The one from the EU on April 13th, right. Canada, U.S., Mexico border sure. on April the 21st. We'll, what will happen with all They'll of that? They'll be staying, and we may add a few more, but the guidelines will be very much as they are, uh, maybe even toughened up a little bit. But they're having a big impact. They are having a tremendous impact, and we're starting to see it. And that's the key. We're starting to see the impact that they're having. And, and if I could ask you, too, uh, you talked about Ford now ramping up production yeah. of ventilators. The government is sending right. thousands of ventilators across the country. Uh, clearly, the supply is, is increasing. But when you look at, at the production curve uh, against the hospitalization curve, uh, can you guarantee that everyone who needs a ventilator in the next few weeks will be able to get one? Well, I think that some are ramping up to a level that they're not going to have to, John. And I think that uh, we also have kept in reserve. We have almost 10,000 ventilators uh, in our line. We have them. We've held back just because we did the stockpile. Uh, we didn't want to give them because we don't know where the emergency. This hits. It hits like so fast. It comes so quickly, and we have 10,000. We're probably going to send some of them now. We've been sending a lot to Michigan and various other states. We'll probably send some additional ones to Michigan. New York's been doing very well, but we can add some more to New York. We're adding them to the areas that are having a problem. Even Alabama, all of a sudden, uh, flared up a little bit, as you saw over the last couple of days. And we'll send them down to Alabama. So we have 10,000. We kept them for this very specific purpose. Uh, it sounds like a lot, but it's not when you think about it. But we're making a lot. And when you see you're talking about hundreds of thousands being made in a very short period of time, because if you look at what uh, just so we have now uh, 10 companies at least making the ventilators and we say go ahead because honestly, other countries really they'll never be able to do it. It's a very complex piece of equipment and so, it's it's big and expensive. Do you believe, as, as we approach this peak in a couple of weeks, that there will be enough for the American population? I do think so, yes. I do think so. Uh, I think we're going to be in very good shape. And we had a great call today with the governors. And uh, they were — I actually said, I hope that the media is listening to this call, because it was a really good call. And that was uh, randomly selected, largely uh, Democrats and Republicans, and they're — uh, I think, for the most part, they were saying thank you for doing a great job. And we discussed that at the end of the call. So it really uh, — people are very happy with what we're doing. Now, the circumstances are so terrible because of what's going on. But I think they're very impressed by the federal government. I watched that beautiful ship floating in today into, uh, you know, weeks ahead of schedule — almost four weeks ahead of schedule into New York Harbor, comfort. And I watched the Mercy floating in to Los Angeles a week ago, almost a week ago. And uh, they are stocked. They are really ready to go. They're stocked with both talent and tremendous amounts of equipment. And uh, the Navy and everybody else involved, they got it ready so fast. It's, it's just incredible what they can do. They've geared up. That's why, I mean, I, I am so impressed by the people involved. Mike and I were talking about it before. The level of genius to put it all together so quickly. This wasn't — a month ago, nobody ever heard of this. Nobody had any idea. Uh, the Mercy was being maintained. It was in maintenance for a month. And when they heard we needed it — and I was surprised. They said, sir, we're ready to go. I said, what do you mean? You're not going to be ready for three weeks? No, sir. We're all ready to go. It was incredible. So — and we've had many instances like this. I think the building of the hospital, 2,900 beds in uh, a matter of days, a few days, is just incredible. Uh, Governor Cuomo was impressed. and. Uh, Gavin Newsom was impressed by what we've been doing with Gavin in uh, California and Los Angeles area in particular. But 
really San Francisco, all over, all over California. Uh, when you look at what we're doing with Michigan, we're getting along very well with Michigan. It's a great, great place. We're sending a lot of things to Michigan because that's becoming a hotbed, uh, especially a specific area, as you know. It's become very hot. It's become, uh, I don't know, could even at some point supersede, but it's, it's got to be taken care of. So we're uh, — the relationship we have with the governors, I, I just wish you could — because we took a lot of calls from a lot of different states, and I wish you could have heard. Even a thing where, like, the governor of Ohio calls, where he has a company that does the sterilization, but they have a problem because it's not going quickly at the FDA. And I call up Steve, and Steve comes at and he said, uh, we'll get it done. And they checked it, and they got it done almost immediately. And originally, they were approving it for 10,000 masks. And then it was supposed to be for 80, and they ultimately approved it for 120,000. I mean, it's a tremendous number. And I kept wondering, why aren't they sterilizing these masks? You know, I assume maybe you couldn't do it. But then I'd look at them, and they'd look like, you know, it's not cloth. It's something that looks like it could be sterilized, and that's what they've done. And that's the, the, the machine that is over there, actually. They have a piece of the machine over there. I won't bother showing it to you. And this is incredible when you talk about five minutes, 15 minutes and highly accurate, and not nearly as uh, disturbing to do as the other tests. So we've just gotten better. We're doing things that nobody else ever thought of. Please. The DMV has issued stay-at-home orders, but Governor Ralph Northam of Virginia took it pretty far. He issued a 70-day stay-at-home order. Is that constitutional, first off? And secondly, do you think it's warranted to go ahead and issue a 70-day guidance at this point? Well, we're letting the governors do in their states pretty much what they want with our supervision, and they consult with us in all cases. Uh, some go further than others, as you know. I mean, I could give you plenty of examples, but I'm not going to do that because uh, we never want to be controversial. But uh, some of the governors have taken it a step further. Uh, and people are questioning — people are questioning that. But, look, staying at home, uh, with respect to what we're talking about, doesn't bother me at all. People should be staying at home. That's what we want. Uh, OAN, please, OAN. 2,405 Americans have died from coronavirus in the last 60 days. Yeah. Meanwhile, you have 2,369 children who are killed by their mothers through elective abortions each day. That's 16,500 children killed every week. Yeah. Two states have suspended elective abortion to make more resources available for coronavirus cases. That's Texas and Ohio. Do you agree with states who are placing coronavirus victims above elective abortions, and should more states be doing the same? Well, I think what we're doing is we're trying to, as a group, governors, and that's Republicans and Democrats, we're just working together to solve this problem. Uh, that's been a uh, — what you're mentioning has been going on for a long time, and it's uh, — it's a sad event, a lot of sad events in this country. But what we're doing is now we're working on the virus, we're working on that hidden enemy, and I think we're doing a great job on uh, — as good a job as you could possibly do. When uh, when Tony and Deborah came up with numbers yesterday to say that if we did nothing, you could lose 2.2 up to 2 point — maybe beyond, I don't know, maybe beyond, but 2.2 million people if we did nothing. And I can't tell you what the — unfortunate final toll is going to be, but it's going to be a very small fraction of that. So uh, we're doing an awfully good job, I think, with what we're doing. Please, go ahead. Ohio? Please. Uh, um, are you considering it all a nationwide stay-at-home order? I know there's a lot of states that have put them in place, but some haven't. I'm just wondering if you were considering some sort of broad stay-at-home order. And then I have a question for Dr. Burks, too, yeah. if you don't mind. Well, we've uh, talked about it. We. Uh, you know, there are, obviously there are some parts of the of the country that are in far deeper trouble than others. There are other parts that, frankly, are not in trouble at all. So hopefully, hopefully, we're going to be able to keep it that way by doing what we're doing. Uh, so we talked about quarantine, as you know, the other day. A group came to me and they wanted to do the quarantine, and I said, "Let's think about it." And we did, and we studied it. And by the time the evening came, it just was something that was very unwieldy, very tough to enforce and something we didn't want to do. Uh, but we did advisory, and uh, I think that's doing well. I mean, I, I see — I look at the streets. You look at New York, where there's — I look down Fifth Avenue, 
Today, they were showing a shot of Fifth Avenue and sort of prime time, and there was almost nobody on Fifth Avenue. I've never seen that before. There was no car. There was no anything. So I think the people of this country have done an incredible job. Uh, if we do that, we will let you know. But it, it's pretty unlikely, I would think, at this time. Can I ask a quick question for Dr. Burks yes. also? Um, so, Dr. Burks, if you don't mind, um, you had mentioned uh, today that this model that predicts 100,000 deaths is if we do things almost perfectly. So I wanted to know, are we currently doing things almost perfectly, or are there more things we need to be doing to cap, you know, to, to not exceed that 100,000, 200,000 model? Please, come. Thank you. I think that's a really great question. Um, and tomorrow we'll go through all of the graphs and all the information that we took to the president for the decision. But when you, and I just want to thank the data team that's working day and night to get, I mean, I usually get my data about 2 a.m. from them, um, and they assimilate all the data from all the states. And when you look at all of the states together, all of them are moving in exactly the same curves. And so that's why we really believe this needs to be federal guidance so that every state understands that it may look like two cases today that become 20, that become 200, that become 2,000. And that's what we're trying to prevent. And I think states still have that opportunity, but they're going to have to do all of these recommended, I mean, these recommendations are recommendations that the globe is using. And so we really do recommend that every governor, every mayor looks very carefully and ensures that their communities are utilizing these guidance. Thank you very much. It, it is amazing. You look at Louisiana, and for a long time, it was just it was just staying at nothing. And then all of a sudden, I look one day and I see a lot and a lot and a lot, and then it explodes. And now we're working very carefully and very uh, Powerfully with them, we're building hospitals, so we're building a lot of different things for Louisiana. So it's very important. Yeah, please, go ahead. Thank you, President. Um, we had warned that this could be seasonal, seasonal cyclical virus. So, and maybe both of you could comment on this, and Dr. Burks as well. Are you prepared for this to strike again, say, in the fall? All the efforts that are taking place right now to contain this, to be proactive, uh, and. Yeah. You We're prepared. I hope it doesn't happen. Doctor, would you like to say something about that? I hope it doesn't happen, but we're certainly prepared. In fact, I would anticipate that that would actually happen because of the degree of transmissibility. However, if you come back in the fall, it will be a totally different ball game of what happened when we first got hit with it in the beginning of this year. There will be several things that will be different. Our ability to go out and be able to test, identify, isolate, and contact trace will be orders of magnitude better than what it was just a couple of months ago. In addition, we have a number of clinical trials that are looking at a variety of therapeutic interventions. We hope one or more of them will be available. And importantly, as I mentioned to you many times at these briefings, is that we have a vaccine that's on track and multiple other candidates so I would anticipate that, you know, a year to a year and a half, we'd be able to do it under an emergency use. If we start seeing an efficacy signal, we may be able to even use a vaccine at the next season. So things are going to be very, very different. What we're going through now is going to be more than just lessons learned. It's going to be things that we have available to us that we did not have before. Okay, please, go ahead. Scott got Thank you. Scott Gottlieb, your former FDA commissioner, wrote a roadmap for recovery after yeah, the coronavirus. Very interesting. I saw it. He suggests, uh, the, the roadmap suggests that everybody wear a, a mask in public. Is that something that the task force uh, thinks is a good idea? Well, we haven't discussed it to that extent, but it's certainly something we could discuss. We're getting certainly the number of masks that you need. Uh, we are in the process of talking about things. I saw his suggestion on that. So we'll take a look at it for a period of time, not forever. I mean, you know, we want our country back. We're not going to be wearing masks forever, but it could be for a short period of time after we get back into gear. People could — I could see something like that happening for a period of time. But I would hope it would be a very limited period of time. Doctors, 
they'll come back and say, for the rest of our lives, we have to wear masks. Yeah, the, the roadmap also talks about um, doing GPS for social distancing, maybe follow, following people's phones, and hotels for isolation for people, uh, giving them free hotel rooms. Are, are those ideas that you're looking at? Well, the GPS, that's a very severe idea. I've been hearing about a GPS. So what happens? A siren goes off if you get too close to somebody. That's pretty severe. But he's uh, somebody. He was with me for a long time. He worked. They did a great job at FDA. So, uh, so we're going to we're taking a look. I just I just received it a little while ago. He sent it over. So very good. Go ahead. Let's give it a shot. Sir, uh, what do you say to Americans who are upset with you over the way you downplayed this crisis over the last couple of months? Uh, we have it very much under control in this country. The coronavirus is very much under control in the USA. It's going to disappear. It's like a miracle. It will disappear. Uh, March 4th, uh, we have a very small number of people in this country infected. March 10th, we're prepared. We're doing a great job with it. It will go away. Just stay calm. It will go away. What do you well, say to Americans who believe that you got this wrong? And I do want them to stay calm. And we are doing a great job. If you look at those individual statements, they're all true. Stay calm. Uh, it will go away. You know it. You know it is going away, and it will go away. And we're going to have a great victory. And it's people like you and CNN that say things like that. That uh, it's why people just don't want to listen to CNN anymore. You could ask a normal question. The statements I made are: I want to keep the country calm. I don't want panic in the country. I could cause panic much better than even you. I could do much. I would make you look like a minor league player. But you know what? I don't want to do that. I want to have our country be calm and strong and fight and win. And it will go away. And it is incredible, the job that all of these people are doing, putting them all together, the job that they're doing. I am very proud of the job they're doing, that Mike Pence is doing, that the task force has done, that Honeywell and Procter and & Gamble and Mike and all of these people have done. I'm very proud. It's, it's almost a miracle, and it is, the way it's all come together. And instead of asking a nasty, snarky question like that, you should ask a real question. And other than that, I'm going to go to somebody else. Please, go ahead, please. Uh, you expressed some concern in the past that medical supplies were going out the back door and that perhaps yeah. some hospitals were doing things worse well, than Well, I hoarding. expressed what was told to me by a tremendous uh, power in the business. Uh, he said that at a New York hospital, for a long period of time, he was giving 10,000, maybe maximum 20,000 masks over a short time. And all of a sudden, he's giving 300,000. And I said, no matter how bad this is, could that be possible? He said, no. So there's only a couple of things that could happen. Is it going out the back door? And I've reported it to the city and let the city take a look at it. But when you go from 10,000 masks to 300,000 masks, Mike, over the same period of time, there's something going on. Now, I'm not making any charges, but when everyone's looking for masks, and by the way, that's another thing. We're making a lot of masks, and the sterilization process is going to save a lot of time and a lot of masks. But when, when you have the biggest distributor of product that distributes to many of the big hospitals and hospital chains, and he brings up a statistic like that. And I know you're trying to make a big deal out of it, but you shouldn't be. You should actually go over to the hospital and find out why. You shouldn't be asking me. I'm just saying are that's you, the way it is. You, uh, you should go over there as a great reporter. I have no idea who you are, but that's okay. You should go over there, go to the hospital, and find out how come you used to get 10,000 masks and you had a full hospital. New York City, always full. And how come now you have 300,000 masks, despite the virus and all? You have three. How do you go from 10 to 300,000? And this is very serious stuff. I mean, I could see from 10 to 20, or from 10 to 40, or 50, or something. But how do you go from 10 to 300,000 masks? So what I think you should do as a, I'm sure you're a wonderful investigative reporter. You should go to the hospital and find out why. Okay, I'm yeah. Your QJ to look into it, sir. Steve, please. Well, it's, uh, it's so bad for the economy, but the economy is number two on my list. First, I want to save a lot of lives. We're going to get the economy back. I think the economy is going to come back very fast. Uh, Steve's just asking about the economy. What's it like? Uh, we basically shut down our country. 
And we did that in order to keep people separated, keep people apart. They're not working in offices. They're not in airplanes together. You know, we really shut it down. And, you know, 150, 151 other countries are pretty much shut down. But here, we're the, we had the greatest economy in the world. We had the greatest economy in the history of our country. And I had to go from doing a great job for three years to shutting it down. But you know what? We're going to build it up, and we're going to build it up rapidly. And I think, in the end, we'll be stronger for it. We learned a lot. We learned a lot. And I have to say, we've had great relationships with a lot of countries. Uh, China sent us some stuff, which was terrific. Russia sent us a very, very large plane load of things, medical equipment, uh, which was very nice. Uh, other countries sent us things that I was very surprised at, very happily surprised. Uh, we learned a lot. We're learning a lot. And we're also learning that the concept of borders is very important, Steve. It's very important. Having borders is very, very important. But we have uh, done an incredible job. The economy is going to come back. My focus is saving lives. That's the only focus I can have. We're going to bring the economy back, and we'll bring it back fast. Yeah, please. Follow up. Go yeah. ahead. Oh. Please. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. You said several times that the United States has ramped up testing. So I just talk a little quicker or a little louder. Mr. President, you said several times that the United States has ramped up testing, but the United States is still not testing per capita as many as many people as other countries like South Korea. Why is that? And when do you think that that number will be on par with other countries? Yeah, well, and it's, Dr. it's very much on par. The, the, look, look. Well, Per capita, we have areas of country that's very hard. I know South Korea better than anybody. It's a very tight. Do you know how many people are in Seoul? Do you, do you know how big the city of Seoul is? 38 million people. That's bigger than anything we have. 38 million people all tightly wound together. We have vast farmlands. We have vast areas where they don't have much of a problem. In some cases, they have no problem whatsoever. We have done more tests. What I didn't, I didn't talk about per capita. We have done more tests, by far, than any country in the world, by far. Our testing is also better than any country in the world. And when you look at that, as simple as that looks, that's something that's a game-changer. And every country wants that, every country. So rather than asking a question like that, you should congratulate the people that have done this testing, because we inherited, this administration inherited, a broken system, a system that was obsolete, a system that didn't work. It was okay for a tiny, small group of people, but once you got beyond that, it didn't work. We have built an incredible system to the fact where we have now done more tests than any other country in the world, and now the technology is really booming. I just spoke to uh, — well, I spoke to a lot. I'm not going to even mention. I spoke to a number of different testing companies today, and the job that they've done and the job that they're doing is incredible. But when Abbott comes out and does this so quickly, it's really unreal. In fact, one company, I have to say, that stands out in the job — and I think I can say this. I don't want to insult anybody else, but Roach. Roach has been incredible uh, in the testing job they've done. And they're ramping it up exponentially. It's up, 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 up. And you should be saying congratulations instead of asking a really a snarky question, because I know exactly what you mean by that. You should be saying, congratulations to the men and women who have done this job, who have inherited a broken testing system, and who have made it great. And if you don't say it, I'll say it. I want to congratulate all of the people. You have done a fantastic job, and we will see you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you.